Friends, uh, good day everyone, our subscribers, our friends, our brothers in Christ, welcome everyone to our evangelistic ministry. First of all, if ever the world needed encouragement, now is the time. If ever individuals needed hope, it is at this time. God in His mercy has placed this ministry, Vic Balbidu Evangelistic Ministry, as one of the means to deliver His message of hope and comfort in the midst of the deplorable global situation. The Bible stands as the only true message of hope and comfort. It alone carries the words God has written to mankind for our salvation and our peace. God perfectly knows those who have trusted in Christ as their Savior. God the Holy Spirit has used the proclamation of the gospel as a vital component to accomplish his work of salvation. The main thrust of this ministry is to lead people to Christ and to lead believers to make Christ real to their lives, not to lead people to a religion. Furthermore, this ministry does not subscribe or is never affiliated with any religious organization. In fact, it is purely autonomous and independent, only dependent on what the Bible says. So it is then our prayer that God may continue to allow His Word, the Gospel, to have free course in the entire world. That is according to Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6, in verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6, Who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Matthew 19, 29, And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on the things above, not on things on this earth. In preparation for our study of the Word of God this uh, day, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. Our objective, to prepare ourselves for the study of the Word of God, which is the most important thing we do in this life. Now, I know there are many things that you find to be important, stimulating, entertaining, exciting, even thrilling. But there is nothing more important than what you are going to do in the next half hour, or so, and to sit still, to concentrate, to assimilate the information requires all of the objectivity, all of the self-discipline, all of the concentration, so that God the Holy Spirit can provide by controlling your life. And therefore it is imperative that you have the privacy of your priesthood in order to rebound if necessary in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we fulfill this important function. Therefore, let us pray.
because we belong to the Heavenly Father, we have the right and the privilege of fulfilling our priesthood by listening to the teaching of your word. We recognize that our growth, our orientation to life, our understanding of your plan, your purpose, your design for each one of us is based upon the constant, daily, consistent assimilation of your word. We recognize that there is no substitute for the word, that there is no capacity for our life that can be in any way counterfeited apart from what we have because of Thee. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Thank you for providing for us this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit now sanctify it to the nourishment of our soul, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome, everyone, to our daily Bible study. And uh, so today we have a new topic to discuss. And this is one of the most important and basic uh, things in the Christian life. And it is entitled, Living by Faith. Okay? Open your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and uh, 2 Peter 3.18. Okay, if you're ready, God's Word mandates every believer to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's 2 Peter 3.18. Now we already know the three levels of spiritual growth, namely baby believer, adolescent believer, and mature believer. Now in James chapter 2 verse 14 through 26 it says in James 2 24 especially faith without works is dead. Now these verses James 2 14 through 26 is dealing not with salvation faith not with the soteriological faith but with phase 2 faith. You see, there are three phases of the plan of God. As a review, phase one, salvation, Acts 16, 31. <coughs> phase two, believer in time, 2 Peter 3, 18. And phase three, believer in eternity, Revelation 21, 4. Now, phase one, faith, is activated faith in the soul. It is activated by positive volition. All members of the human race have faith as part of the essence of the soul. They do a lot of things by faith every single day. Most people sit down and eat, and believers with some knowledge of the Word of God usually pray and ask God's blessing on the food they eat. Everybody has faith as part of the essence of the soul. But in salvation, faith is directed toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is activated faith. And it's activated by positive volition. Now, that's phase one of the plan of God. And one sixtieth of a second after somebody has accepted Christ as Savior, he immediately now moves into phase two of the plan of God. And phase two of the plan of God extends at the moment of salvation represented by the cross, as far as the church age is concerned, through death or the rapture, whichever occurs first. If it is death, the believer goes out either the sin unto death or dying grace. If it is the rapture of the church, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But whichever comes first, the believer then moves into phase three 
in the plan of God, which is the eternal state. Now, salvation faith, soteriological faith, is faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. But faith to faith is the faith of the faith rest life, which means now faith is directed toward knowledge of Bible doctrine, knowledge of the Word of God. So there is a parallel here in the principle of appropriation. Faith is the mechanism of the acquisition of eternal life. This results in the acquisition of eternal life. Faith in phase two means that God imputes grace blessing to the believer in phase two. Spiritual blessing and temporal blessing. In phase one, faith on the Lord Jesus Christ means the believer is delivered from the lake of fire. In phase two, faith of the faith of life means the believer is delivered from divine discipline, which is the, the byproduct of negative volition toward the word. And James 2, 14 to 26 is not describing phase one faith, but rather phase two faith. Okay? I hope that's clear to you. And it says that if a believer has activated faith, he's going to automatically produce divine good, called in the context here as good works. If the faith is activated with positive volition, it's going to result to the production of divine good. If the faith is not activated by positive volition, then it is deactivated or neutralized by negative volition, resulting in the production of human good, which means dead works. And therefore, there is an equation we will look or we'll look at in a moment. Now here again is the cross, representing point of salvation. Now on the left side, you have the cross. Like I said, representing the point of salvation. And then there are uh, <clears throat> uh, two things on top of it is union with Christ. Now union with Christ is permanent, eternal. So, these are what happens to the believer. He possesses eternal life. He becomes a member of the royal family of God. God imputes righteousness to him. He is positionally sanctified. He is elect. He is predestined. And he is a believer priest, etc. He cannot lose that relationship. That's on top circle. Now let's go to the bottom circle, which is temporal fellowship with God. So, Operation Bottom Circle is what we call on the temporal fellowship with God. Temporal fellowship with God, the filling of the Holy Spirit, redeeming the time, God's spiritual rest, and here is where the believer is walking in light. He's walking in faith. He's walking in in uh, truth. So I repeat, here is where the believer is walking in light, he is walking in truth, he is walking by faith. And here, because the believer is walking in fellowship, it means, listen, there is no evil in his life. There is no mental attitude sins, there is no motivational sin, there is no lingual sin, there is no overt sin. There is no sin in his life, which means he has a relaxed and powerful mental attitude because he has doctrinal orientation, doctrinal objectivity, doctrinal confidence, and doctrinal courage. And get this, the greater the knowledge of doctrine the believer possesses, the greater the doctrinal confidence and the greater the spiritual self-esteem. In doctrinal orientation is going to have in life. And the greater the category one suffering he is going to have, the greater the intensity of it. That is suffering according to the will of God. Compassion suffering for the salvation of unbelievers, for the spiritual growth of believers. 
A believer who loves the Word of God, the happiness and the love is so fulfilling and so wonderful that he wants all other believers to have the same thing. So now, he has compassion suffering for other believers to get plugged into the Word because he wants them to have the same spiritual blessing that he has. And he wants them to have the same divine viewpoint, historical impact, and ministry that every believer functions with doctrine he has in phase two. He wants them protected from evil in life. He wants their problems solved and problems prevented. That is compassion suffering. And God tests this believer. Sometimes he tests him through prosperity. Sometimes he tests him through adversity. Sometimes he trusts him through both. And then there is testing or suffering that comes from the evil of others. The evil of unbelievers. The evil of reversionistic believers. The evil of Satan and the demons. But because the believer is in fellowship with God here, this is the branch and the vine analogy of John 15, 1 to 7. Therefore, he is productive of fruit. It's called the production of divine good. In John 15, it's called fruit. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, it's called gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, in the context here, it's called good works. It's divine good. And divine good is related to the fulfillment of the will of God and related to, at the same time, spiritual love. Because divine good means it's the highest and the greatest good. In which the believer not only acts in his own best interest, but the execution of the will of God, his adjustment to the righteousness of God and justice of God, to the omnipotent or omniscience, I mean, of God, to the sovereignty of God, to all aspects of divine essence. But he is adjusted to the standards of the Word of God through knowledge of the Word. And therefore, he acts in his own best interest, and he acts in the best interest of others. That's divine good. That's the greatest good for the greatest number. And because he produces divine good, he automatically, well, he has divine viewpoint historical impact on himself. Because every act of divine viewpoint, every act of faith, every act of positive relation and courage empowers the believer to keep on going and produces momentum in his own soul. But he also has divine viewpoint, historical impact, and influence on others, which means he influences unbelievers to accept Christ as Savior, and he influences other believers. He influences other believers who are functioning with the faithless life to keep on going and doing the right thing. And this is the kind of believer that God uses. Now, there is an equation. This is still related to faith and deliverance. Every unbeliever has the ability to believe. That is faith resident in the soul. And in salvation, the object of the believer's faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 30 and 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In salvation, faith is directed toward the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 4, 12 says, Neither is there salvation on any other under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is only one way to get eternal life, and that is faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way to get eternal life. It is believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the grace, opportunity of fellowshipping in your word today. 
May God, the Holy Spirit, motivate and challenge us in uh, continuing, continuing to feed our soul with your word until we reach the stage of capacity for life, which is the Pleroma stage. Thus, become winners in this present life and in the life thereafter. We pray now that what we learn in your word today may become a blessing to our life. Thank you for our Bible study through the YouTube of the Vic Balbido Evangelistic Ministry. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.